thank you for uh, coming and thank you especially for this wonderful award. It was quite a surprise uh, that I was nominated or uh, given it. Um, and I'm especially pleased about the wonderful uh, esteem and respect you've shown my writing with this Marianist Award, especially on this grand feast of the birthday of Mary. Looking at the list of past recipients, I noted so many scholars whose work I have read and admired, but I felt a, a mistake surely must have been made in including my name among them. And it's especially an honor for me that I seem to be the first fiction writer selected to receive this award. I accept it gladly and proudly on behalf of all those Catholic fiction writers who have inspired and taught me over the years. Flannery O'Connor, Walker Percy, Edwin O'Connor, John LaRoe, Alice McDermott, Tobias Wolfe, my wife Bo Caldwell, and so many others. The birthday of Mary. It falls, of course, nine months after the Feast of the Immaculate Conception on December 8th, which happens to be the birthday of myself and my twin brother Rob, which meant that all through grade school at Holy Angels, at high school, at Creighton Preparatory School, Rob and I and our classmates were given a day off <laughs> for parties and movies and bowling at Hilt Kelly's Hilltop Lanes. So those birthdays without classes were perhaps my first Marian Award. <laughs> It incited in me feelings of gratitude and kinship with Mary of Nazareth, or Mir Miriam, who was perhaps, or was indeed, the first teacher of Jesus. In the oral way of education among the peasantry of Palestine, the holy teenage mother must have used stories to help the Christ child learn Aramaic, practical lore for their lives in Egypt and Nazareth, and Jewish family legends handed down for many generations. In both oral and literate cultures, stories function to make coherent, expected, and tolerable the collective experiences of the people. Whether those experiences be sickness, death, and conflict, or marriage, childbirth, farming, and making ends meet. It was perhaps Mary's gifts as a storyteller that invigorated Jesus' genius for an analogy of hearkening to his heritage, even as he annulled some of it, and all the while inventing entertaining, instructive, and provocative narratives. The Gospel of Matthew has it that Jesus told the crowds these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fill what had been spoken through the prophets. I will open my mouth to speak in parables, I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. In one of Garrison Keillor's monologues on his Prairie Home Companion radio show, he relates, Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, my hometown out there on the edge of the prairie. Most of the leaves are off the trees. Of course, the corn is all combined, the beans as well. The fields are mostly just stubble. It's a November landscape, a reminder to all of us to look for our warm things and to get ourselves a good windshield scraper. When the big storm comes in a week or two, you don't want to have to be there scraping ice up your windshield with a credit card. It would look like you weren't from here. It's a good time, winter, for all of us. It's a time when all the things that we've been postponing for months can now be put off for a good while longer. <laughs> all those improvement projects, including self-improvement, those can all be put off until spring because winter brings us back to basics, food and heat, and of course, the obligation that we all have to tell stories, which is why God put us here after all. That is to live rich, full lives and then to tell about it, or better yet, to know other people who have li lived rich, full lives and tell stories about them. American mythologist Joseph Campbell called those stories we find ourselves telling a cacophonous chorus that originated with our primal ancestors exaggerating their heroism in hunting expeditions and speculating about the occult world that the spirits of slaughtered animals journeyed to after their deaths. We are all fiction makers, 
even when we feel we're adhering closely to the historical record, which is of itself a fiction, a thing shaped or made. For even in our narratives of a trip to the grocery store, there are elements we heighten or shade or color. There are amendments, excuses, and subtractions. There are invented comments or things we wish we would have said. There are failures at full disclosure. And always there is an affect, our feelings about what happened to us, or often for fiction writers, our feelings about what happened to others. But the need to fasten one's stories to a page and hand out one's collected pages to strangers and to overtly deal on those pages with the things of religious faith is odd, as lots of reviewers of my fictions have said. And I have decided to, <laughs> to use this occasion to say a little about the origins of that oddness. One of my first childhood memories is a scene in the kitchen of our home on Fowler Street in Omaha. I was in my first year in a high chair adjacent to my mother, and my twin brother Rob was in a high chair facing her. At the far end of the kitchen table, sunlight filling the window behind her, was my sister Ginny, seven years older than Rob and me, and notoriously antagonistic to vegetables of all sorts. <laughs> my mother was spoon feeding my brother and me something dark green from a Gerber's bottle mashed peas or spinach or whatever. And Ginny, holding back a grimace, asked my mother if the boys really liked that stuff. My mother said they seemed to eat almost everything. And I was struck at the age of one, without of course comprehending what I'd learned, that the English language had been a kind of wild snowstorm around me until then. But when my sister or mother, whether my sister or mother recognized it or not, I now understood every word they said. Half a century later, I found myself wondering why I so clearly remembered that kitchen scene until at a dinner party, a lady friend who was a psychiatrist told me that language acquisition is the first step in the separation between children and their mothers, and I had stamped in my mind a primal scene in which that differentiation became luminous. Even as I now am reading what I have written about making things up, I am joining you in our calling, our similarities, our joint aspirations. But I am also using these words, these verbal events, to fashion a new reality that wholly separates me from you. Writers in particular seem to have a greater need than others to do that, but it seems to be a hard, hardwired in humanity in general. To paraphrase the British poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, each mortal being does one thing and the same. Myself, it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. Rob and I, as twins, worked out a language of our own, as many twins do. My father's father had made us a play table so that we faced each other with our wooden blocks and toys and my mother would duck her head into our bedroom to hear us happily chattering away in a vocabulary completely invented and which we alone understood. When we were four or so, we were heading to downtown Omaha and about to bump over the railroad tracks beside the Nabisco factory. I turned to Rob and said a word like whorehound, which meant railroad train to us and perhaps was a child's imitation of the wailing noise of a locomotive as it approached a crossroads. My mother turned in the front seat of our car and asked with honest curiosity, what does that word mean? You always say it here. We both stared, stared forward, saying nothing, gun shy. And that was the last time I can remember speaking our invented language. I now have forgotten our secret vocabulary and I regret it. I've written elsewhere about being accidentally excluded from a kindergarten Christmas pageant, worried that it meant I was flunking out of kindergarten. I went up to my kindergarten teacher during recess and with fear and trembling indicated that she'd given me no part in the play. The sweet nun saw my worry and was inspired by pity to say, well, we'll need a narrator. You can be St. Luke. And so it was that I stood in front of a hundred grown-ups in folding chairs and recited from memory the gospel narrative of the nativity. Just five years old, but up there on stage and being paid rapt attention 
Not because of my performance, but because of Luke's storytelling power. My first grade teacher was Sister Clyda, a harried Dominican nun who is handling her purgatory time here on earth <laughs> in a classroom of 32 hyper children, some of whom were incompletely housebroken. <laughs> And as comedian Bill Cosby has pointed out, all children are brain damaged. <laughs> One afternoon, Sister Clyda taught us some basic arithmetic and introduced us to the concept of a quiz on the material she just covered. We were handed out half sheets of lined paper and were supposed to solve the addition problems she chalked on the blackboard. Well, just the night before that particular test, I had learned to fold a paper airplane. <laughs> And that sleek craft yawing and banking in fluent flight seemed to me far more interesting than the resolution of the problem, what is four plus two? She sidled down the crammed aisles of the classroom, collecting the quizzes, and I handed over my paper airplane, which such gleeful innocence that she thought at first it was sarcasm. And even in seeing that it was not, she blew, as they say, a gasket. <laughs> Her red face and sharp scolding revealed I had pushed her to the brink. And I suppose, fearing that she might do me harm, she took me by the hand and marched me across the hallway to the seventh grade classroom. There the nun who was teaching accepted me with calm. And my sister Ginny scowled as I smugly took a seat in the big kid's desk, my feet dangling, my folded arms as high as my chin on the writing table. I could not understand anything the nun was there was talking about, but I felt I'd scored a major victory and skipped six grades with my paper airplane. <laughs> I knew it was a snazzy invention. I just knew it. After an hour, when the older nun thought it safe, I was conveyed back to my first grade class, and a pacified Sister Clyda said nothing to me. I was happy, content, with zero remorse for my grand adventure. And getting away with that had more than a little to do with my becoming a fiction writer. The fiction I write seems to me merely grown-up versions of paper airplanes. <laughs> <laughs>